Good morning. Welcome, everyone. I'm Victoria Budson, and this is the Women in Public Policy Program Seminar. And today, we have such an exciting event. We are so pleased to have Muriel Royer, who's joining us as a visiting professor here at the Kennedy School. She's been a professor of political science in France at the Universities of Nice and the University of Nantes since 2003 and 2004, respectively. Her work focuses on an examination of French feminism and within the context of looking in both Europe and the US and how the comparative landscape of feminism is unveiled. She has also been been a practitioner uh, on gender issues at the National Agency on Gender Parity in France as well as the EU. She's working heavily with the Center for International Studies and there has been doing a new project on the European culture of rights and we are so thrilled that you have been here with us and we will miss you terribly when you have to return to France. I think we have all been waiting with bated breath to learn about the Strauss-Kahn affair in transatlantic perspective, which was such a gripping example, as are the events taking place on Capitol Hill this week, about how far we haven't come. And what does this mean? How should we process this? What should we do about it? So I look forward to your talk as well as our discussion. I think you all know that here at the Women in Public Policy Program, our work focuses on the closing of gender gaps. And we look at doing so within countries in the areas of political participation, economic opportunity, education, and health. And I wanted to give two special hellos this morning. One to Leah Porvu, who has been a longtime supporter and friend of the program, who I'm so pleased is joining us today and is an expert on French culture, among other things. Um, and Jane Mansbridge, who has been faculty chair for many years at the Women in Public Policy Program and now heads our advisory committee um, and is a blessing all the time. And so, a pleasure to have her with us at the seminar. Um, this, um, this program, this uh, Women in Public uh, uh, women in Public Policy Program is a great place to be. I'm, I'm so happy uh, to be here, uh, and, I'm, and I'm just so happy that this, that this program exists. <laughs> I wish we had more places like that in France. Uh, it's it's uh, even better than the uh, the Observatoire de la Parité in France, with better expertise, knowledge, very stimulating knowledge, and fascinating people I've been meeting all along your seminars. So it's a great pleasure and a great opportunity to be here. Um, I would also like to thank um, Jane Mansbridge, who is here today, and Iris Bonnet for introducing me to this uh, wonderful place. Uh, and thank you for your uh, kind introduction. I will just add a few uh, little elements which will um, allow you to understand and to contextualize the presentation of today. So I, I, I'm uh, officially a professor of political science um, in France. Here I think I should say I'm a political theorist because my interests go to uh, feminism in France and in Europe. Um, but what I really specialize on <coughs> and teach on uh, at Harvard this year and, and in France is the European Union and the theory of democracy of the European Union. I'm trying to figure out how this big entity can become a transnational democracy. And that is the object of my current uh, uh, working. I recently published a book on European cosmopolitanism. Um, I'm now working on a book on transnational democracy uh, in Europe. And I'm hoping uh, to publish a book, a small book, uh, drawn from my course here on global Europe. So my stay at Harvard has, has really been very fruitful and uh, I'm, I'm very thankful for that to, uh, uh, to all of you. Um, thank you all for being here despite poor weather and other opportunities you have on the campus to attend many uh, events. So this presentation is actually, um, I decided to write a special paper um, for the WAP, uh, which connects to my research um, in the extent that um, I'm interested in transnational democracy, constitutional democracy, and culture of rights. Uh, and this event, which occurred unexpectedly last year, the, the, uh, the Strauss-Kahn affair, um, in many respects questioned my work and questioned my feminist convictions and my uh, research on um, judicial citizenship, transnational democracy, and gender uh, relationships. So I thought it might be a good idea to devote a paper on this, uh, diverging a bit from my uh, core research, but very connected to it. <coughs> so there is a paper circulating, if you wish. Uh, I just uh, gave it today. 
and uh, it circulates, so you're most welcome to comment and to uh, ask questions on it. It's a very drafty version, so I ask uh, for your uh, <laughs> indulgence and, and forgiveness. All right, so as a, an introduction, um, I would like to state my intention um, on this um, affair. I will give you uh, sources and facts on this affair which has been quite complex and where many people have spoken, uh, not spoken, sued, not sued. Uh, so I think here a bit of sociological work was necessary and I'll try to uh, <laughs> give you this insight. And I'm sorry if there are too many facts, I'll try to be brief. Uh, but what mostly I will do um, is to draw from this affair an interpretation on uh, cultural globalization. Uh, France, as you may know, doesn't like to be reminded that the world exists around her. Uh, and this affair was a cruel reminder that other conceptions of gender, of equality, exist. So France was harshly submitted to a, a, an episode of globalization. And uh, what I want to demonstrate here, and how I want to demonstrate that this episode um, showed and highlighted the contribution of feminism as a transnational movement to a transnational culture of rights which is both democratic and gender friendly and this I'm hoping to, um, um, to show this to you by studying the different reactions that have occurred in the two countries and by um, drawing theoretical lessons from um, this episode um, so I um, will start with a few um, facts to remind you briefly the affair although probably most of you have heard of it. Uh, <clears throat> so, as you uh, all know, uh, Dominique Troscan was, used to be, uh, the director of the International Monetary Fund. And he was traveling to Europe for a very important uh, conference when he was spectacularly arrested in the plane uh, at JFK Airport and charged for sexually assaulting a uh, chambermaid. <clears throat> whom I can name now because her name has become public, Nafisa Diallo, uh, on the 14th of May. Uh, during the three days following his arrest, he spent a night in, in prison, he was refused bail out by uh, the, the judge, Melissa Jackson, and was submitted to the infamous perp walk, uh, which absolutely um, indignated uh, the, the French public opinion. Um, so he was jailed and um, this episode triggered in France very emotional reactions, which I will study, um, and which are absolutely uh, shocking from the other side of the Atlantic in terms of gender equality. Uh, and, and they were shocking for French opinion too, so much so that uh, soon after the arrest and the reactions, uh, on the 21st and 22nd of May in France, <coughs> demonstrations were organized in solidarity with the maid uh, and to protest against um, a macho culture in France. Another issue which interfered with the Diallo Strauss-Kahn case was that another French woman suddenly stepped in the case, added a second affair to the first affair, and the second affair is the Tristan Banon affair, which I will highlight here uh, for you with a, a short film, which is absolutely um, edifying. Uh, in the end, as you may know, um, <coughs> Strauss-Kahn was set free uh, at the end of August after the public prosecutor, Cyrus Vance, could not find any, um, any evidence um, against uh, him because the maid had a credibility problem. And so she decided to change her uh, strategy and to go from penal to civil action. Uh, but at the end of the, the story, uh, Strauss-Kahn was out of the presidential race, which was a big stake for, for him and for French public opinion. And uh, Tristan Bano also uh, saw her case closed uh, with half satisfaction, and I will come back to this, um, to this case. So th this was a brief reminder of, uh, of the case to um, contextualize a bit uh, the following of this presentation. So what I'll do in three steps is first to study the contrasting receptions of the affair on the uh, two sides of the Atlantic. Um, I identified a male stream discourse in France, which has uh, basically three figures that I will focus on. And I opposed this discourse, uh, this French discourse, to um, 
a very different type of discourse held in the US and which I call uh, the culture of rights discourse. So very, very different discourses. Then in the second uh, stage, I'll um, study both affairs, the uh, implication of both the Diallo uh, Schwarzkan affair and the Bano uh, affair. And we'll show you that this made for a very interesting case of transatlantic justice for women. Uh, where Tristan Bannon found a kind of trial by proxy to uh, claim justice, which she couldn't find in her country. And thirdly, um, <clears throat> I will re-examine French feminism <coughs> in a transnational perspective, which means, I know that's very interesting, that the French feminists, who were actually very moved and mobilized by this, uh, this affair, um, uh, were, even, were pushed even further by an American feminist who interpolated them over the Atlantic and forced them to rethink and to uh, reawaken uh, their principles. And that is, that is really a fascinating case of intellectual dialogue um, across the Atlantic, which has had very interesting effect, again, that I uh, interpret in terms of, um, <clears throat> of transnational um, culture of rights. And my research question behind this uh, um, focused paper is how how can we trigger transnational progressive coalitions that trigger uh, democratic and gender friendly culture of rights? This is my research question, and I'm hoping that this paper will help you grasp um, <coughs> that research question. So, um, contrasting receptions of the Strauss-Kahn case: mainstream discourse versus culture of rights. Um, I agree that this, this is it. Yeah, can you see the red point? So this reflects the shock and the awe in which all French people were in France when they first heard about his arrest. Uh, you see, the, the figure. I mean, the representation of the man is really very telling and very different from uh, the, the the reflection that was given in the U.S. Although I agree with you, this uh, this second picture with Le Perve, uh is less telling of a culture of rights than a tabloid culture, but <laughs> um, uh, I must say that had tabloid uh, papers existed in France, uh, maybe Strauss-Kahn would still be in the presidential race and he would probably still have his job because of the, the pressure and the control that newspapers can exert on public opinion. So yes, it's tabloid, but tabloid sometimes have a, an interesting effect on the behavior of uh, powerful people. So the first figure, um, this mainstream discourse that um, I was able to identify by studying the press, the TV, the radio shows and broadcasts uh, that went on during the whole <coughs> second half of uh, 2011, uh, basically showed three, three figures. Uh, this discourse was driven by a kind of virile political friendship, which I call philia, uh, denial and conspiracy, and indignation. So the first figure of this um, discourse was immediate and emotional. It was, um, uh, it was triggered by um, the friendship that linked many of the commentators who first took the floor in France after the arrest, it was triggered by their personal and political friendship to Dominique Strauss-Kahn. And this friendship led them to side with him out of personal conviction and to minimize his alleged offense, presenting it as a simple episode of seduction. Um, so very prominent intellectuals, journalists, or even former ministers took the floor at the time. And that time is very short. Again, it's like three days after the arrest. So that's from 15th of May until 18th of May. Um, and they all you know, they took the floor on national public networks. They were interviewed by TV and, and uh, radio shows. And what they did was basically to certify uh, uh, on, on Strauss-Kahn's good morality. Maybe he was a seducer. as his political friend uh, Pierre Moscovici said, probably a seducer that was no secret to anyone, but certainly not a rapist. And that conviction was shared by a famous uh, journalist, Jean-François Kahn, who became infamous for this little phrase, 
which became viral on the internet and forced him in the end to uh, apologize and to resign. And uh, he was interviewed early in the morning on France Culture, who is a famous national radio network. And he basically said, I translate uh, uh, roughly, I'm practically certain that there has not been a violent rape attempt on uh, Strauss-Kent's part. No attempt of violent rape, as if there were attempt of nonviolent rape. <laughs> uh, he has been careless here, how to say, maybe some skirt lifting with the maid have occurred, has occurred, which is not good. That's the impression I have. You can imagine that even this, this even in France, triggered um, a powerful reaction uh, which forced him to resign. Um, nevertheless, um, this first move was telling of a culture where men and women's sexual interactions are very much supposed to stay behind closed doors, especially between people of unequal uh, status or power, a domestic, a servant, for instance, or even um, master and disciple, such as in the academic relation between supervisor and supervisee. And France had an infamous case of sexual harassment between a supervisor and uh, his supervisee, which led nowhere because of, of our culture. We can, <coughs> if you want to go back to this later. Um, so there is actually a law in France against sexual assault and sexual harassment. And uh, this law exists, um, has existed since 1992. But it is very difficult to implement, and very often um, it leads to um, legal retaliation by male defendants or resistance on the part of judges. And there are edifying cases uh, of French courts who refuse to qualify a sexual assault as such, and who rather qualify it as, let me quote, conventional signs of seduction. So, <laughs> this is really part of the culture and uh, despite the law. Um, so, therefore, given this culture, sexual inter interactions um, come under the male jurisdiction of droit de cuissage, uh, which is not really an English equivalent, but would be um, maybe the right of the Lord by feudal custom, custom to deflower the local maidens. And here um, I put this picture by famous painter uh, Jean-Honoré Fragonard, who was a libertin uh, painter and who was painting under the monarchy. And uh, I don't know if you can see this really well. You have here a very good representation of the urgency of male desire uh, with the, the man closing the, the lock. This painting is called The Bolt, so it's a reference to the closing of the door, to the protection of intimacy and private behind locked doors. This young man is dragging the young woman who doesn't seem to be so consenting. And here, if you study well the um, picture of the bed, as commentators have done, I'm not especially, but it's interesting to see here a knee, a kind of female knee, a representation of female breast, and here, a kind of male um, organ. So this is a good allegory of the urgency of male desire, which um, seems very much in order still in France today. Second figure of this male stream discourse, conspiracy theory. Who manipulates who? Um, this is the second figure of this male uh, stream discourse, which was held by socialist comrades of uh, strauss uh, They were very frustrated to see their champion uh, threatened to fall so close to the goal. Uh, the primary elections in the Socialist Party were scheduled for October um, 2011. And so this thesis was, this hypothesis was proposed very early on by his political uh, mate. But it became very quickly very popular. On May 18th, 57% of the French, but 70% of socialist supporters uh, believed, did not believe that Strauss-Kahn was guilty, but they thought that he was the victim of a conspiracy. And this is a very serious opinion poll that has been quoted by several uh, French papers. Indeed, such a hypothesis was highly plausible. 
why would a man in such an advantageous position as he is about to become president, he was very popular, uh, he was in charge of the um, IMF, why would he do such a crazy thing so close to the goal? So at the time, and I was part of these people, and I must do my mea culpa here, everybody thought either this man is completely crazy or he has been set up. By the way, a recent article of the New York Review of Books uh, gave new credibility to this hypothesis, a very serious investigation. So this is not that people were completely uh, uh, obtuse and, and stupid. There, there was something strange. So his um, uh, lieutenants explained this, this, um, this hypothesis in the press. And uh, um, Jean-Claude Cambadélis, who is not mentioned here, but who is a very close uh, um, politician close to Stroskan was explaining to uh, on TV that this was all the more plausible this uh, plot theory since uh, Stroskan's enemies had promised to light a nuclear fire as soon as Stroskan would step in the presidential campaign and this fire meant something very precise it meant digging in his private life to find out nasty little secrets that everybody knew uh, it was so well known, uh, uh, Stroskan was such a famous womanizer that uh, a very irreverent comedian, Stéphane Guillon, could uh, joke about it on a very popular radio morning show. Um, and he triggered hilarious laughter in the studio and, and uh, Stroskan's anger. And it was a very funny episode where he would advise all the staff of the radio station to wear burkhas because Stroskan was arriving <laughs> on the set. And of course, Trotskyan was not very happy about that, but everybody knew uh, that it was true, and that's why they were laughing. Even Trotskyan himself knew that his numerous liaisons made him vul vulnerable for a trap. Uh, and he, he had confessed this to journalists during the run-up to the presidential campaign in April. He was interviewed by uh, Liberation, and he said, yes, I like women, so what? And in th that same interview, he admitted that he had three weaknesses. Money, because he was tremendously rich, thanks to his wife, Anne Sinclair. Women, because he has so many affairs. And Jewishness. This has not played against him so far. Uh, it is indeed that. So the, the thing is that what is not clear um, by um, in this gallant phrase, I like women, is that it actually meant having numerous extramarital affairs, approaching quantities of women, oftentimes harassing them for months to have sex, which included uh, a dimension of abuse, not, cons not mentioning consuming prostitution, which in France is legal anyway. Um, but those facts were deliberately ignored by the French press in accordance with a very restrictive um, code of silence, omerta in it Italian, which refers to the uh, mafia practices of silence. Uh, so um, this was, was done in accordance with a very restrictive um, code, which, has, um, which rests on, on two feet, on power structure and cultural traits. Uh, first, there is a, f a very restrictive libel law uh, which protects privacy tremendously compared to Anglo-Saxon countries. Um, but it's also something cultural. And in France, the press is not very strong. In the 30s, it, it's a contrast with the, 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 the past. In France, in the 30s, the press was known as rotten press, la presse pourrie, uh, with corrupt journalists blackmailing politicians in order to not reveal scandals. But today, French journalists often lack journalistic courage, and I quote a, a French journalist, Jean Quatremer, uh, and why that? Because the interests of the powerful are still embedded and protected by the press, as illustrated by recent cases where um, editors, journalists, humorists had to resign or were pressured uh, by their radio station or by their newspaper um, after unpleasing Nicolas Sarkozy or his ministers. So that's part of the problem which uh, makes for this omerta. 
another part of the problem is actually um, illustrated by this second uh, painting, and it's um, a very hierarchical and harsh division between public and private sphere, which is entrenched in the French Republican social and sexual contracts. So here you can see this. Um, this is a, an oath made by the Horaci, um, uh, which is supposed to, to um, symbolize, according to uh, the, the painter uh, Jacques, um, I don't remember his first name, David, a famous revolutionary painter, uh, which has symbolized here, which has represented the Republican civility, which is all geared towards, towards the public sphere politics. Um, and so it's a wary or um, a field. It's a, it's a place where uh, men are together um, and they fight, and that's the, the police. The, the, and, and women and are... Military over yeah, that's the, the military as, uh, aspect of, of uh, police, polemos. Uh, and here the women are confined to their little private corner, grieving, crying, and they're supposed to represent emotions, privacy, etc. So uh, that's something, it's something which is well known in, um, <coughs> um, in political liberal theory and which has been criticized by famous... Um, uh, political theorists um, such as Carol Pateman. But this is very uh, true of um, French political culture as well. Maybe even truer because we have a real Republican fetish. So as a result of this political culture, um, sex and its corollaries such as sexual violence is confined in, into privacy, often called intimacy. And this private sphere has long been excluded from public expression and scrutiny. Although uh, in France too, second wave feminism has questioned this um, order of things. Um, so fr the French press is clearly not a fourth power and the, the Strauss-Kahn affair has highlighted this in a very crude and ironical manner, ironic manner. Had they been less complacent uh, towards Strauss-Kahn, French journalists could actually have exerted a real counter power, democratic and gender friendly, sparing many women from the sexual harassment he subjected them to, but also paradoxically saving him from himself, so to speak, by keeping him in check. And had he seen perv pictures of himself everywhere, maybe he would have behaved a bit more. Um, and this keep, keeping in check of, uh, of the rulers is precisely what the media should do in a democratic public sphere. Um, and this reveals the power of public opinion. But in France, uh, public sphere is quite corrupt and susceptible to private interests. To use Habermas' uh, terms, it, public sphere can easily degenerate into a platform for advertising where private interests take over public reason and true communication. And in the Schwarzkan affair, the French press has actually proved highly susceptible and submissive to public relation offensives that were led by the presidential couple to be spin doctors. Um, uh, you, you probably uh, know that. Uh, Strauss-Kahn had a very expensive and comprehensive uh, presidential uh, strategy, a political communication strategy that was paid by Anne Sinclair and which hired many uh, counselors of the famous uh, advertisement agency Euro uh, RSCG, which is a very powerful public relations agency. <coughs> and this strategy has involved consciously a silencing of any comment on um, Strauss-Kahn's sex affairs. It has built a media-conscious chastity belt around him. I quote from a, a journalist that is not rotten, and that is courageous, <laughs> a journalist from Le Monde. So it built a, 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 a media-conscious chastity belt around him so that women were actually a non-topic. They were lightly referred to as seduction, libertinage, or love of women on the part of uh, Strauss-Kahn. And in such a context, it appears that Strauss-Kahn's communication counselors might have been the ones manipulating the opinion rather than Strauss-Kahn being manipulated by uh, someone else. However, true or not, this conspiracy bears effects in reality. If the theory is true, is not true, sorry. Um, and so if, uh, if uh, Strauss-Kahn actually committed the offense, 
Then the authors of the setup had an easy job trapping a man so widely, widely driven by his impulsions and probably not deserving or maybe not wanting to be a statesman. If this theory is not true, no, excuse me, ooh la la. <laughs> if the theory is true, sorry, if it's true, uh, but, but this is a rhetorical figure, I'm uh, untangling myself. Um, yeah, if the theory is true and then uh, the, the SK did not do anything, um, but still, he was very weak. He was, he was susceptible to fall, and that was an easy job, because, and he knew it, and everybody knew it. Yeah. And the, if the theory is not true, and so if Strauss-Kahn is actually the perv uh, depicted by American tabloids, then uh, the conspiracy reflects a mental construction of the French, a kind of denial uh, to face the nightmare they were diving in, although it's not very clear. Uh, what nightmare means. And all the French commentators, journalists, com at some point said this was a nightmare. It was impossible. Uh, it, it's not very clear what they meant. Was it the, humi the humiliation of a powerful French figure? Was it the shame triggered by the cracking of the code of silence? Um, was it the painful situation of women victims of sexual violence? Probably all of that altogether. But all of that, of course, did not come out as a, as a block of sudden revealed truth. It came by successive waves of emotional reactions, denials, and debates, which fed one another. The ultimate stage of denial was orchestrated by a, by a few famous and vocal intellectuals who, by focusing exclusively on Strauss-Kahn's potential Innocence ended up exasperating French and American public opinion and triggering a vivid feminist reaction. So this is the first, um, the third, sorry, the third figure of this mailstream discourse. Yes. Yeah? Is it all right if I ask a question? Um, could, could you keep it for the the end or or not? If if, if it obstructs your understanding, please ask your question. Well, you see, you're setting up what seems to be a false dichotomy. Either he was set up or he was uh, guilty. Actually, he could both be guilty and also... Set up. Yeah, which is probably what happened. Can, can we go back to this just after? I think okay. I will rush a bit and, of course, go back to your question. Thank you. So I chose on purpose um, a pictures that were forbidden in France because in France you can't show uh, a person shackled um, uh, unless it has been proven guilty. So that was the origin of the shock. And this is the basis for the third uh, figure of, of the mainstream discourse. Uh, Strauss-Kahn is innocent, uh, indignant intellectuals versus America. So this third figure actually borrows from a very famous genre, which is the construction of a public affair by intellectuals uh, who appeal to public opinion to defend universal principles when institutional justice seems at fault. This repertoire of action is well established in France and has had several variants. Uh, national and transnational, from the Dreyfus affair at the end of the 19th century to the more recent um, Sacco and Vanzetti affair between the US and uh, Europe and uh, France. Uh, this episode, this third figure, also epitomized another episode of the famous transatlant transatlantic misunderstandings between France and uh, the US. Um, and one recent episode of these misunderstandings had uh, occurred two years before with the Roman Polanski affair between France and the US. So nothing very original here, but um, the, the mainstream intellectuals use this uh, uh, figure very, <coughs> um, very thoroughly. So in the present case, the Strauss-Kahn uh, case, the principle at stake was the presumption of innocence, which is a sacrosanct uh, principle of French justice. And it comes as a corollary to the dignity of the person. It is stated in the law and it, it is um, um, enforced by uh, the uh, Conseil Supérieur de l'Audiovisuel, the National Broadcast Regulatory Agency. So according to this law, um, anyone publishing 
uh, spreading, uh, commenting, but showing the image of a person shackled when it has not been proven guilty by a trial is uh, susceptible to penal um, uh, sanctions and can go to, to jail. So it's a very severe law and it, it really um, um, encapsulates a very deep principle, which is probably uh, more familiar to European people than to American people. But that's that's a principle, and as such, it's not it's not a bad principle. It's just a principle. But the problem is that it was voiced and repeated ad nauseam by a fraternity of public friends who voiced a loud and angry critique of the American system of justice, which was considered to violate the right of Troscan to an equitable trial without a word for compassion, uh, of compassion for the victim of the alleged rape, Nafisa Tu Diallo. Um, so, I uh, reproduced here excerpt of the first words that were pronounced by this fraternity of famous uh, people, among which Bernard Henri Lévy, a famous self proclaimed intellectual philosopher who was very harsh on America and on the victim of the rape, especially the French one. Um, he published um, this on his blog, and his blog was reproduced the very day, the same day, on the Daily Beast, the blog of the Newsweek magazine. And in the, this article, uh, he basically said that he is, he accuses. Uh, like it, it takes the pose of um, Emile Zola in the Dreyfus Affair. I accuse, um, I am troubled by a system of justice modestly termed accusatory, meaning that anyone can come along and accuse another fellow of any crime, and it will be up to the accused to prove that the accusation is false and without basis in fact. Robert Banater, another famous um, figure of <coughs> penal law, because he, he was the one to have inspired François Mitterrand to abolish death penalty in France, is very prestigious. He's a current senator, he's a former minister of justice. And what he said was just defending his friend and accusing the American system of justice of, justice of being a populist uh, system which uh, look for blood and, and image and spectacular uh, events and which has represented this, this man shackled, uh, mistreated, um, and not having slept, having spent the night in prison. And this was degrading for the human person and for the principle of innocence. And I must say that this is a powerful motive to, um, to react against uh, what happened to uh, Strauss-Kahn at the time. <coughs> Even feminist, um, famous um, feminist figures in France were shocked and said, this, this, is, not, this is not okay. <coughs> and, even in the States, some disagree with the perp walk and find it a bit obscene uh, and maybe not necessary to perform justice. That was, um, that was a, a second important uh, <coughs> a voice in, the, in this figure. And the third voice, Jack Long, also a former minister of culture, socialist and a friend and supporter of Strauss-Kahn, echoed a similar opinion when commenting on the unusually harsh treatment that has been given by, uh, to, to Strauss-Kahn. After Judge Melissa Jackson refused to bail him out, um, he said, and this comment has been also distorted and has become viral, this is an unusually harsh treatment, which usually does not happen um, when no one has been killed. Uh, which in, Fran uh, in French is in n'y a pas mort d'homme, which sounds a bit like, well, it's a trifle. Nobody died. Um, okay, so, so this also became viral. So overall, French public opinion was very shocked by the treatment um, inflicted to a potentially innocent man. And here comes um, a complication in this affair. Um, uh, with the, 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 the entry of uh, Tristan Bannon. Uh, but first of all, I want to make a few comments on um, the difference of treatment of the affair between uh, France and the US. So what is the vantage of the culture of rights, the vantage point? Well, it's to, basically it's to have considered the affair from the very beginning in a judicial manner. The, the, ma the woman was assaulted and she complained about it. She has a right to do it. She has a right to body integrity. And she just did it, even if she was poor, even if she belongs to a minority. And that was that illustrated the egalitarian uh, aspect of the American system of justice. In France, by contrast, 
everybody reacted with, I would say, sublegal arguments. Humor, indignation. Um, the French did not seem to realize they were in a, in a judicial case. They did not seem to realize that what was at stake was something forbidden. And that um, sexual matters are judicially adjudicated. And why that? Because body integrity is part of your individual rights and you have a right to your body integrity. Um, and this is a very deep uh, dimension of American democracy and this has been highlighted by, by Tocqueville. It's something which expresses something very deep about individualism and democracy in America, which the French don't seem to have so much so far. And France on this occasion appeared a bit backward and tangled in the um, hierarchies of the old social order. And some young American uh, commentators on, the, on this uh, affair uh, were very sad that the French left was still lacking a cultural revolution on gender and ethnic issues. And France appeared clearly backwarded on this, uh, on this matter. Fortunately for women in France, techno technological globalization, the internet, alternative media provided easy access to alternative opinions. Um, and namely access to the press coverage that was made in the US of the affair, which was very different. From the very beginning, major papers such as the New York Times uh, covered Strauss-Kahn's previous affairs. Not all of them so consensual uh, contrary to what was usually alleged in the French press. Um, as revealed by Piroshka Nagy, the former affair he had had at the IMF, and Piroshka Nagy was interviewed thoroughly by the New York Times, which was never the case in any paper in France. So an international outcry followed the first reactions of French editorialists. Um, and this... Um, the French exception, seduction, privacy, was actually quickly dismissed as the sexist reaction of a clique of narcissists with a monstrous sense of entitlement. I quote here Michel Goldberg from The Daily Beast. The most shocking trait of this mainstream discourse, as was immediately pointed out by American and French feminists, was that it clearly uh, either ignored the victim as in the presumption of the innocence case, or blamed her, said she was, she was lying, she was you know, maybe a prostitute, she had combined something. So in a word, shame on the victim. And this was never truer than in the course of a second sexual assault affair, the Bannon Affair, Franco-French, uh, which came out in the light of the Diallo Schroeskan trial. Tristan Bannon, this young lady, uh, is a young writer and journalist. And so far, she had remained in the shadow. And she suddenly stepped in on May 16th, two days after his arrest. She stepped in the light to accuse him and sue him for rape attempt. Uh, most embarrassingly for the French intelligentsia, um, who had willingly ignored it, it was taken very seri seriously by the foreign press and by Nafisa Tudiello's lawyers. Of course, Tristan Bannon was right away dragged in the mud by Bernard-Henri Lévy and some of his lieutenants uh, who called her a storyteller, an opportunist, who, and here I quote again Bernard-Henri Lévy, who pretends to have been the victim of the same kind of attempted rape, who has shut up for eight years, but sensing the golden opportunity, whips out her old dossier and comes to flog it on television. So now I think I, I um, will show you an extract of um, a TV program which lasts two minutes where you have been given a little um, handout, yeah? And I'm going to read this before turning the TV on. If I can find the version I have for myself, which has disappeared, okay? So um, here I want to show you a little film of a TV program. Thank you so much. Which was, thank you which was actually uh, broadcasted in uh, 2007 and where Tristan Bannon um, basically told her story, told how she got assaulted by uh, uh, Strauss-Kahn 
And it, it's very touching and very embarrassing because she does this in, in a very inappropriate arena, which is not a court of justice, but a TV set. And uh, it, you'll see how, how people react and how she's, she's constrained to say something that she never could say anywhere else. So, um, Oh, so do you want me to read this? Yeah. So it goes, because it, there's a lot of... of um... We can read it while we listen. Okay, can you do that? Is it okay with you? Okay. Let's do that. The sound? No sound? So first line? He's obsessed with women. No, no women wants to work with him. And the only person he found to work with him is an obese 60-year-old uh, woman. So what happened? So what happened? I was working on my first book. And I was asking for the biggest mistake of political politicians. So, so she talks to Strauss-Kahn. And he says, I will call you back. And then he makes an appointment with her to, to, the, to pursue the interview. So she's surprised because she, he gave her an address to have the interview and the address was not the usual address. She happens to know him through family relationships. She arrives in an empty apartment, very beautiful apartment. Mr. has a good taste. So he closed the door. I put the recorder on the floor to record. And he wanted me to hold his hand to uh, start the interview. And then from the hand, he went to the arm and then a bit higher. And then I stopped. When I arrived, I was wearing a black turtleneck. And we ended up fighting. It finished very violently. We fought. I not only slaps in the face, kick, I kicked. He unhooked my bra and my my pants. And so, if he does this, he can do anything. Then he sent, he texted me. So do I scare you? And, uh, when we were fighting, I pronounced the word rape to, to scare him, but he was not scared. He was probably accustomed to that. And then he kept sending me text or texting me. So I scare you. So I scare you. So did you do anything? Yeah, I went very far. I went to see a lawyer specializing in those matters, but in, I didn't dare to go to the end. I didn't want to be, uh, until the rest of my life, the girl who had a problem with uh, beep. All right, did, did, uh, did you get uh, everything? Yeah, so this is appalling. Uh, if, if the case is, is true, and why should it not be true? Uh, these young women had to come out and say, yeah. Is this a, a fairly common thing to have sort of interviews at a, at a, at a, at a big table? <laughs> well, this is a, a very special a program. Television interview. And then no, it's not meant. This is a mondain. Yeah, and, and it's a it, it mimics a mondain dinner, and uh, the uh, the um, animator of this um, program is a bit sleazy, a bit trendy. It, it's a very special program. But the the fact I want to draw your attention to here is that he had to come out in an inadequate arena, and. Even though she did this, even though there were journalists in the in the room, everybody knew it. 2007, um, nobody reacted, mm -hmm. and some journalists grotesquely said, "Yeah, I knew, but I, I thought, you know, people would talk to me uh, and and uh, so that I could speak." It's very very bizarre discourse on the part of journalists. So this is uh, this is appalling. This is a very bizarre thing indeed, and. Um, and so, yes. Can I ask you, when was the television show? 2007. 
that was aired in 2007, yeah. and then she came out to the press. She came out last year. because nobody listened to her, so she kept this for herself. She became a bit depressed, and you know, so this she had before her appointment to the IMF, yeah. his appointment to the IMF. Yeah, appointment. and the but facts uh, go back to 2003, which is a problem for prescription, like, which was a problem for prescription. So I should uh, probably hurry because I would like to give you some time for the. Um, the questions. Um, so what I would like to, to um, emphasize here is that the, there was a stark contrast between the two affairs, the Diallo affair and the uh, Bannon affair, and still both worked hand in hand to advance women's rights in France, and especially for her, uh, who finally found um, a place to name to name, blame, and shame the man who had done the, to her the same he had done to uh, Diallo. And in one country, Diallo could feel entitled to, uh, to act. And in France, no way. She was silenced. She was treated as a liar. She was doubted everywhere. And she couldn't, she couldn't speak. She couldn't be heard. So it's quite understandable that she leaned on the American case to make her own case. Um, and what I find is that this Strauss-Kahn Diallo Bannon case has opened an um, unexpected transnational arena for, for her to claim justice. And this is precisely thanks to, to this other woman in the States who was born by a much more buoyant culture of rights and who gave her the courage to go to court and to claim justice. So she ended up with an uh, imperfectly, uh, with an imperfect case, where justice was made, partly in court, partly in the public opinion. She received uh, support from uh, feminists in France, but she also went to court. So she went to court on July the fourth, two thousand eleven, accusing Schwarzkan of rape. That's a panel case. Uh, what happened is, is a bit strange too, <laughs> uh, because she she got uh, she got satisfaction, but half legally, half not. The court said, "Okay, um, this was not a rape. This was a sexual assault, and because of that, the prescription is only three years. So your case is closed because it's too old. Had it been a rape, you would still have a case, but that's not possible." Uh, so, Can you explain the legal determinants in France between? Rape and sexual assault? Um, rape um, wants a penetration by surprise, threats, or other means. Penetration is the criteria. Uh, sexual assault is um, like an un. Sexual assault is a, a, an attempt to, to do something with you, and if you don't express your consent, uh, if you say no, uh, and if there has been surprise, uh, threat, or violence, then this is sexual assault, but there has not been penetration. Uh, well, there are subtleties in which if penetration was meant but did not occur, then it's still a rape. But there was no such a thing there because she fought, <laughs> she was strong enough. But still, uh, so she was actually happy with the decision. She considered this as a half victory or even a victory because at last she was heard and she was considered a victim and not a liar. Although immediately Strauss-Kahn, as French law allows it, retaliated by suing her for calumnious denunciation. And this is a very serious problem in French law, which is being changed thanks to, European Union, to the European Union. I'm just mentioning this here because there was a lot of, you know, of suing, of legal action. Uh, and, and, but, but women, you know, some feminists say that French law organizes access to their bodies. And I think this is partly true. I mean, we should have a longer discussion on this, but there are many, many obscure points, and the expression of consent is very demanding, and it's not easy to preserve your body integrity uh, before courts. So she was, you know, happy with the decision, um, and, 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 and Strauss-Kahn's lawyers were also happy because they considered he was proven innocent. But Bannon's lawyer said that he was an unjudged sex aggressor. All right, so you see the contrast between the two affairs and um, the, let's say, the default on the French uh, side. So now to move on and quickly uh, finish, um, I would like to re-examine French feminism in transnational perspective. Um, so how did French feminists react to this whole affair? 
First of all, you should know that French feminism has always been divided between egalitarianism and differentialism. Um, uh, Joan Scott, famous uh, gender studies uh, historian, said French feminism had only paradoxes to offer and great tensions between those attached to equality and those attached to difference. And those tensions have not disappeared uh, despite the paritarian revolution in 1999. So what happened is that there were basically um, two positions two, three positions. On one hand, new wave feminist, young movement uh, that, that one could term third wave feminist, um, found in this affair an opportunity to shape up their agenda and orchestrated a visible mobilization against French macho culture. Um, and so basically the, the images you saw on the website are from those anti-sexist movements who, who basically rehearsed a bit the themes of second wave feminism, of uh, the feminism of the 1970s, but with a few new topics and a few new methods of action. Um, but other, uh, other feminists, and mostly individual intellectuals, remained quite, sil remained quite silent. And this silence was broken by John Scott, famous intellectual and feminist. And that is the um, interesting thing I would like to highlight here. So um, the third wave uh, mobilization basically organized a trial of um, macho political culture. So very early on it reacted to um, the arrest and to the, to the mainstream discourse. So you had on the 21st of May a manifesto against sexism, which basically said, we don't know what happened in the, in the suit, in the Sofitel, but what we know is that what we hear is terrible. And oops, it is not, what we hear is terrible, it is not, um, it is not okay. This is the demonstration of a, of a this is an example of, a, of macho culture. And so they demonstrated against um, this uh, political culture which allows men to say such things. Uh, we are seducers, not rapists. So basically they denounced the confusion between sexual violence and um, f sexual freedom or seduction. Um, the minimization of rape as a crime, the denial of victims, and basically they did the trial of a culture which was very much elite driven and, um, and which was arrogant. So you have interesting, interesting reflections uh, and comments which have been made in this book, uh, Un Troustage de Domestique, Skirt Lifting with the Maid. This is the translation. And those are texts which have been collected during the affair and published <coughs> at the end of the affair. Uh, this is um, the picture of a new um, association called La Barbe, the beard, which in French means uh, La Barbe, it means oh, we are fed up. So um, uh, th those groups actually were um, popped up very um, opportunately at the moment. Some of them did not exist before the Strauss-Kahn affair. This, this is the case of Oser le Féminisme, Dare to be a Feminist, which really was created with the Strauss-Kahn affair. <laughs> And uh, those movements, if you want to call it to, if you want a sociological insight on them, they are a minority, clearly. They did not gather more than 5,000 people on this demonstration on a Sunday in Paris. Uh, they gathered 30,000 signatures for their manifesto, which, which is okay, but it, it's, not, it's not great in France. So they are clearly a minority movement, but they have very visible techniques of action, uh, symbolic, theatrical techniques, which uh, go very well in, into the media and travel well, and obviously they travel to the website, so it's actually efficient to strike public opinion. Um, that is for one thing. Um, but on the other hand, uh, feminists were quite divided and intellectuals were, remained a bit silent. Elisabeth Badinter, Robert Badinter's wife, who in France was uh, ranked first public intellectuals uh, by a, a popular magazine. Uh, she, she likes to take positions on feminism, although she in, she's not exactly a feminist because she has basically um, 
contradicted, lectured, and opposed French feminism in most of their important uh, struggles, including gender parity. But still, she is often, she's considered, let's say, a contrarian feminist. And I'm quoting here a journalist of The New Yorker who recently wrote a very interesting article on this lady. So she's, she's a famous intellectual and she takes position on feminism. She remained silent. She spoke reluctantly in July on the radio and said that she was shocked by the presumption, that, by the viola violation of the um, presumption of innocence. Uh, she also clearly uh, detached herself from what the French feminist, the French anti-sexist movement was doing because Basically, her line of argument is to say, French feminists do not need to receive moral lessons from American feminists. Mm -hmm. We don't want that. I'm not one of these. This actually is, is an interesting debate to have, but that's her position. But on, on the other side of the spectrum of uh, French feminism, other um, tendencies were also divided. Sylviane Agafansky, former um, a philosopher, wife of uh, former Prime Minister um, Lionel Jospin, who actually supported and fought for gender parity and was a great uh, artisan of gender parity. She also was a bit bothered by, by the, uh, the reaction, the, the anti-sexist movement for various reasons. Um, and so it was not that clear, you know, um, who, what was going on in French feminism? Who, who, who was saying what? Why, why, why were they not all siding with the victims? And so this is precisely the angry reaction that uh, Joan Scott had by writing, by interpolating French feminists from overseas. And she wrote a very powerful piece called Feminisme à la Française, where she said, you all seem to defend this seduction. You all seem to believe uh, in seduction, which is actually um, a power, um, a, a demonstration of power from men over women. And so for a while, she interpolated French feminists. Um, so Badinter is part of them, but she did not reply. Other intellectuals replied. And there was a kind of debate, um, a transatlantic debate, which seemed, uh, which seemed for a while to be one version of, one national version of feminism, French uh, version, um, against American feminism. And so I tried here to map the arguments, although, um, of course, I cannot put everything here. So on the f French feminism side, you have basically people who are reluctant to a war of sexes, who do not want to threaten the kind of compact between sexes or the social order, either because they are paritarians, because in a paritarian order you need both sexes to be part of the global order, and so you need both, and they should not be at war. This is Agassansky's case. Um, or you are clearly Franco-French and you admire France, and um, for many uh, reasons, uh, you refuse American feminism, that, and Badinter is not very clear about what American feminism is. She, she makes a block, a monolith, which it, it, it is not. But she denounces it and she praises a model of due commerce between men and women. And that is something which is common to all the, the feminists who did not speak, indeed. Which is to say, well, in France we have this civility between sexes, we have this gallantry, we like to seduce each other, or to be seduced, and this is part of our cultural, historical heritage, uh, and this is fine. And let us uh, have our interactions that way, which is basically the, the model referred to by the, the bold, the, the, the paint by Fragonard. Um, it is interesting, it is a, a complex model. Um, it refers to gallantry, which was a precise moral code established in the 17th century. And it is more complex than the press has said, and I'm willing to detail this later. But that's you know, more or less the position. But uh, Scott was very harsh and straightforward. She said, yeah, well, who seduces who? Men seduce women, and seduction, as um, even the French admitted, occurs between unequal people, um, but uh, this inequality is, is hidden. It's a soft form of inequality, but still it's a form of inequality and it's a, it's a form of power. It's not equal, it's not equal rights. And that's basically what she said in this article. Um, 
so you may know uh, John Scott's um, uh, work. Uh, she has been instrumental in promoting the notion of gender as an expression of uh, um, sec uh, social sex, and uh, she has pointed out, along with other radical feminists, uh, what gender domination means, uh, what kind of dominations based on sex can occur. All right. Emilio, since we have about 10 minutes yeah, left. I should probably stop here. Yeah, why don't uh, we take questions, and you can weave in your points. Let's save the last two to three minutes for sure. you to um, sum up if the sure, sure, points sure. don't come up in questions. But I'm sure, given for an American audience, uh, how striking the lot. contrasts are, I think, to talk about it. And let me also just note What's interesting, using this as a catalytic event to examine how it did or did not provide agency um, or additional opportunity and how is that opportunity catalyzed or not among the French, was when we had the Anita Hill Clarence Thomas hearings in the United mm -hmm. States, having the role of the media, or it was the first time the American public could see what our leadership looked like and the disconnect between everyday American women's experience that's what took organizations like Emily's List and others to a vantage point where all of a sudden we had money going into politics for women candidates at the same level that they had gone into labor. Mm -hmm. It revolutionized, though our outcomes of the revolution are paltry. It still revolutionized women's interaction with the state. And what's interesting is to see here how perhaps it did not. Um, that's uh, certainly a question for debate. Yeah. <laughs> yes? So I remember reading after this affair, if you will, um, the discussions that it um, that it brought up to the surface, uh, and allowing women to share that yeah, it's not okay. We're seduced in the private sector, and we want to change things around. And it seemed like there was really room for change. Um, and I was thinking about the private sphere in particular. And so I wonder this this uh, the civility and seduction gallantry, etc. Has it changed any of the discussions, for instance, in the private sector um, around... A private sector, you mean uh, firms? Business. Or, or yes. privacy? Well, <laughs> okay, business. business. In this case, and, and because the, those power dynamics... Yeah. Well, um, here, of course, I dealt mostly with the, with politics and the public sphere, but there has been endeavors to promote diversity, and um, mostly big firms are very good at promoting diversity, which means uh, ethnic diversity and sexual diversity, recruiting women, because um, they are conscious that having women is actually a very good point for firms. Uh, they are flexible, they are hard achieving. Um, it, it's very nice to work with women. Uh, what I could say... Yeah, the dynamics have the dynamics but that's a private dynamic. A private sector still is regulated by private uh, codes or um, commitments, you know. But you must um, be reminded that in France, gender parity has uh, changed a bit um, customs and mores in, in the political field. And now uh, a law which is being passed in Parliament is parity within public uh, service, civil service, sorry, which has a very strong... Um, triggering effect in France because the public sector is still very important. So it is important to promote parity on the workplace as uh, in the political sphere because when parity, uh, when there is gender parity, it is likely that there are less cases of sexual harassment, at least the ones that we have met so far. So that's what I would answer you. So the private sector is regulated by private practices, soft law, but it's strongly influenced by the public sector, which is changing. Yes? You, you should absolutely read this very good article by um, in the New Yorker. I can give you the reference because she also recounts the episode, a very bad and traumatizing episode she had in Princeton when she actually met Joan Scott. And she came to America to basically explain to American feminists that uh, they were Puritan, they were not having good sex, and that was not okay. And you know, we are so better in France. So Joan Scott, who is interviewed in the article, said we were just like distressed by her by her presentation. And ever since, Badinter doesn't uh, step in the U.S. except to see her son, and uh, she, she's not welcome, I guess, in the U.S. because she she is typically in a position to lecture about national culture and what she doesn't see, and which actually 
uh, John Scott started to show, and, and the, the, there was a reaction from French intellectuals who sided with John Scott and who said, look, it's not so much uh, a national uh, cleavage, it's political cleavages between two different visions of feminism. It's like on one side uh, you have yeah, this conservative, natural, social and sexual order and, um, and that's the way it is and has always been. Uh, there is a sexual hierarchy between men and women uh, and that's fine. And the Americans have this other approach which is now been, uh, being um, adopted by young feminists, by academics and things have changed or are changing in France. So Elisabeth Banater is, is an interesting case. I, I think she would deserve a whole book. <laughs> um, maybe not as on feminism. <laughs> <That's all. laughs> um, this was um, Jane Kramer, Elisabeth Badanter's Contrarian Feminism in The New Yorker. I'll give you the precise reference if you wish. Yes, Arthur? Uh, you mentioned the uh, prominent intellectuals and politicians who had spoken out in favor of uh, the SK. Uh, those same people have been conspicuously silent in the Lille uh, uh, Carlton Hotel affair, yeah, where yeah. he has confessed to being a libertine, but says he has a horror of prostitution and didn't know they were prostitutes. Oh, Yet none wondering. of his friends have spoken up to defend him, even though this presumably took place in the private sphere, and he claims uh, by consent. So how do you explain that? Yes, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't want to extend the list of affairs. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, for you to know, um, uh, uh, Strauss-Kahn is now uh, investigated for another <laughs> affair de mœurs, <laughs> private affairs, which involves a ring of prostitution in, nor in the north of France, um, associating uh, corrupt p police officers, uh, a public works uh, firm, uh, which is basically suspected of having funded orgies uh, where Dominique Strauss-Kahn took part and he didn't know whether uh, he uh, was dealing with prostitutes or not because all the women are naked, so you can't know if it's a prostitute or not. This is a serious argument that was uh, made by his lawyer to defend him. Um, so uh, he's investigated, he has been set free uh, until March because he is to be heard by the tribunal in New York in the Nafi uh, Satu Diallo civil case and it will go back to France and I think the French judges are very interested in what will happen in the US because uh, in this affair Chauscan is has consumed prostitution which is okay in France it's legal but you can't trigger prostitution or make a benefit for, uh, from prostitution which is called proxenetism yeah. And you can't either benefit from sexual favors that would have been paid by a, a firm whose uh, goal it is not to fund such, um, you know, pre prestation. <laughs> so he, he runs the risk of being uh, um, charged with uh, with abus de recel de biens sociaux, which is unduly using uh, private funds for consuming prostitution. It's true that none of his friends uh, said uh, anything because I think they know that it's true. And as long as prostitution is legal, he has never, you know, I know people who, I know editors who say, yeah, well, I have to go to the prostitutes. That's, that's legal. And he will argue that he didn't know who paid for that. And this is privacy. This is, this is just privacy. So as long as the, the prostitution is legal, which might not last too long, he's protected. And the judges have no proof, no evidence. How do you want to prove that he knew? Of course, everybody who is a bit sensi I mean, uh, sensible knows that everything has a price. But he can legally argue that he didn't know who paid for that uh, and that he didn't know they were prostitutes because they were all naked. And everybody was naked. So. Um, this is just to add a bit of levity because uh, the New Yorker has this section called Shouts and Murmurs and actually this week they have a sort of a parody on this exact defense and it's, it's pretty funny. It is quite funny. It's so, it's so funny. It, it, it's actually not a very good defense because uh, there was an episode in which women flew from France to the United States and one of them was photo photographed with her clothes on in his in office the IMF. The IMF. Yeah. And the police have this photograph. So uh, the naked women defense just doesn't hold up. Well, it, it can still pretend it was a friend of a friend. And in the, um, the famous cell phone which disappeared and that he, he was so desperately looking for, it, um, texts were exchanged about, oh, I'm coming with a friend, I have a young friend. He never used, you know, uh, because he's very cautious, he never used the word prostitution because he knew that it's forbidden in the U.S. But if it's proven that he has imported prostitutes in the U.S., then he's in trouble. 
in here at least. Yeah? What about the rate of divorce of some of these uh, women under age? Uh, I don't think so. No, no. That's not an issue. He's not, in but addition, a pedophile. No, uh, recently, what I heard most recently is that uh, uh, students uh, from Cambridge, UK, were opposed to his coming um, to Cambridge because uh, he was um, he was involved in unclear uh, issues, and there was a debate. I don't know, honestly, I, I don't think he would add that to his case. Yes. Uh, and, uh, Wife under, she has so much money, and I feel like she's important. She's in a fairly wealthy. She has this career. Like, why is she still? What do you think? With him? What's going on there? What kind of? This is actually um, a good question because she's the mysterious one in all this. She remained uh, next to him. She supported him. She paid for him. I think she had tremendous uh, and misplaced ambition because she wanted him to become a president, and I think she should have run for presidency herself. That would have been her lesson. <laughs> Um, so she, she supported him and now she's back to, to her job that she had quit when he became a minister. She was quite ethical at the time to avoid conflicts of interest. She said, okay, I'm withdrawing from the public sphere. But still as a woman, you know, uh, as personally and, and reading the feminist, uh, the French press, I think she gave a very bad image of women, like uh, siding with her, with her husband who had done, uh, there were comic comments on the radio. There was the, this little chronicle entitled, Why Are You Smiling, Anne Sinclair? Your husband has uh, uh, slept with X and Y. Your husband did that and that. <laughs> Why are you smiling? <laughs> it's very mysterious. And some feminists uh, commented on uh, the return of the, of the Mater Dolorosa figure with, um, with Anne Sinclair, who was courageous, who was supporting her husband, as if her husband had, hadn't done anything wrong. And this, to me, is very obscure. And I, uh, this is not the kind of feminism or of attitude I, I recognize as, as feminism. But it's a personal choice. And again, interesting thing is that she also very much shelters herself behind the, the privacy law. She says, it's none of your business. What we do in our couple is none of your business. I'll, tell, I'll talk when it's time for me. But for now, it's none of your business. Jenny. Just, I, I wonder if it meant, um, which is that French feminism has, from the beginning, been very tortured around the sort of sexual issue. And the Lacaniste feminists were you know, more sexy than now. You know, they, they were like, they, um, and Ose, the beauty, beauty of the word Ose, it seems to me, to be its youth and its vigor and its gutsiness. The, 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 the portrayal of feminism in the early era of American feminism was pr prudishness, um, Victorian, uh, yeah. constraint and so forth. And the word dare is an anti-constraint. It's a yeah. youth word. It's a, it's a frontiers word. It's a new word. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very strong word. And it seems to me that when I saw Jose, I thought, oh my God, French feminism is finally back. It's, you know, it's, it's very important too. Um, and what, what do you think about this word, Jose? I mean, do you have that same reaction or not? So you're um, talking about this uh, young movement, Ose le Feminisme, yeah, right? Yeah. Mm. Let's go back to the, maybe to the... Um, right. Yeah, the, um, they are, it's an interesting movement. I didn't know that movement actually uh, before the affair, and nobody actually knew it, so it has been accused of being a bit opportunistic. But all this kind of well, movement... Opportunistic? What should a social movement be? It, they are. <laughs> they, no, they, abs absolutely, I, I totally agree with you. That's the, absolutely... Uh, nobody knew them, and she, um, her leader, Caroline de Haas, uh, was a, a former RP agent for Benoit Hamon, who is a socialist uh, member of parliament. And so, yeah, she was opportunistic, but that's good, because it's for a good cause. Uh, but the, the, the interesting thing is that you can't see here, but they, they did uh, several campaigns. They did a campaign on the, on the clitoris <laughs> to... Um, urge people to rediscover the source of feminine pleasure. So what I think of this movement is very good, it's very nice because they, um, they actually filled in a space which was not filled by anyone. But they, they kind of rehearsed former movements, former topics, you know, of second wave feminism under new guises, and that's fine. And in France, this is very typical of anti-sexist third wave of, um, 
uh, feminism, they, they just rehearse, but it's probably worth it because the problems are still here. Thank you all so much. We've gone over, and we normally always do um, I'm sorry. I couldn't yeah. bear. <laughs> I'm sorry. Conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time.